<clears throat> from a sincere heart, I'm very grateful and I'm thankful for the invitation that you've extended to me to be with you good brethren here at Adamsville this night. I share with Ronnie and Cindy talking about his respect for me. I love those people, I love their families, and I appreciate them dearly. And I love you brethren for who you are and what you are. And again, it's a great honor, and those are just not cheap words. I appreciate this opportunity to study with you God's Word. I'm very saddened to learn of the death in the Deal family. I'll pray for them, and I know you will. They're sweet and precious people, and all of them have meant so much to the church for which our Lord died. When Ronnie called, he gave me the theme of the summer series, if I had but one more sermon to preach. I thought about that a whole lot, even made a PowerPoint presentation, and that was my intentions up until a few days ago, and then I scrapped that, and I thought I would have five simple basic points. I'll not say anything that you haven't heard. I'll not say anything new, and I don't expect you to believe me when I say, oh, I'm just going to keep you on the edge of your seat. You can't wait for the next words to come out of my mouth. That's not it at all. Before God, I feel like the speakers you've had in this series of lessons, I would be the face on the bottom of the totem pole, and I know that. But I hope by our studies tonight, we can leave here being better people and loving God more than ever before. I believe if I had a basics for our lesson tonight, it would be the four questions that God asked Adam and Eve in chapter 3 of Genesis, verses 9 through 13. And that will serve only as a foundation for our study. You remember the Garden of Eden when God gave them simple, plain, and understandable instructions as to what He expected and what He wanted. Then the Bible says in verse 9, beginning, God asked these four questions. He said, number one, he said, where are you? Now we know God knew, but he wanted Adam to respond. Where are you, Adam? In our lesson tonight, I want you to ask that question. Where are you in relationship to God? And number two, God asked, who told you you were naked? God says now, who told you that you were naked in my sight? He said, I didn't tell you that. Who told you that? The third question, God says, why have you disobeyed me? I told you not to eat of that fruit of that tree, and you did. Why have you done this? And then the fourth question in verse 13, he says, what have you done? I believe if all of us would ask ourselves those four questions, our lives would be transformed and our mindset would be upon God and all holy things we find in His divine, inspired, breathed words. If I had but one sermon to preach, I would talk about God, number one. I would go back if I could talk to anybody, whether they're members of the Church of Christ or otherwise, whether they be atheists, agnostic, infidels, where they didn't give a flip or not about religion, I would tell them about God. I learned a long time ago, Brother Ronnie, that I'm not going to argue with anybody a month of Sundays. I'm going to tell them about God and say, now it's your decision what you do with God and if you obey Him or not. I want you to, I encourage you, but I'm not going to spend my time arguing with you a month of Sundays about this. When we talk about God, in Genesis 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning God made the heavens and the earth. We're talking about Jehovah God. We're not talking about Dagon. We're not talking about Buddha. We're not talking about Allah, the God of the Muslims. That is not Jehovah God. We're talking about the one God, Ephesians 4 verse 6, that we read about in the Bible. There is a God in heaven, Daniel 2, 28. He is able to deliver, Daniel 3, 17. And he rules in the kingdom of men, Daniel 4, verse 25. Only a fool denies God. That's what I would tell people. If I had one sermon to preach, and since I was in the pulpit and they were the audience as it were, I would tell them about the God. It would take a fool not to believe in God. 
The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 5, 12, and 18, God said, I'm the only true one God who made it all, and besides me there's none other. God says, I am because I am. I am because I've always been. Exodus 3, verse 14, and he's the everlasting God. Psalms 90 and verse 2. We need to get this concept that God is the one true great God who made it all. He is that great God. Psalms 95 and verse 3. I love the book of Isaiah chapter 41. The first 20 verses, God is telling Isaiah, here's proof that I exist. And then God tells Isaiah, he puts words in Isaiah's mouth to tell the people, prove that I do not exist. Verse 21. That's what I would say if I had one more sermon. I would love to get on the mountaintops and tell every atheist and infidel that one, prove that God doesn't exist. Just prove it. They cannot. I would like to remind people of those in the last 300 years who have denied God and laughed at God and scoffed at God. Like Voltaire and Thomas Paine and Ingersoll and Gambetta and Hobbes and Gibbon and Churchill and W.C. Fields. Remember W.C. Fields on his deathbed? He denied this book all of his life. He denied there was a God, and on his deathbed he was reading this book. And an acquaintance says, Mr. Fields, why are you reading the very book you denied? He said, I'm looking for loopholes. He knew what was coming. Some of these men said, oh God, if I have, oh God, if it be a God, save my soul if I have a soul. Thomas Paine said, send a child to play with me, O oh God. He laughed at God all of his life. Churchill said, what a fool I have been. No wonder God laughs at us, Psalms 2 and verse 4. We think we have it all figured out, and I'd love to shout from the mountaintops to people to point them to Jehovah God who made it all. And said the reason he laughs at us is because of our futility in thinking we have it all figured out. Remember those four questions. Where are you? Who told you? Why have you disobeyed me? And what have you done? Every atheist that takes that last breath will say, what have I done? But it's too late. There are no changes after death. I love to shout to people, and if I had one sermon to preach... To tell them that I know God exists because the Bible tells me He exists. Because Jesus, His only begotten Son, who walked this earth, and we can prove that. He says there is a God in heaven. Mark 10, verse 6. I would love to tell them it's the most logical thing in the world to believe in God. I would love to tell the world the most common sense thing on man's mind is to believe there is a God in heaven. I told Cindy a while ago, two weeks today, our fifth great-grandchild was born. And when I look at that baby, I just smile and I say, no wonder God says a fool do not believe on me. A fool does not believe me and all fools do not acknowledge me. I would love to tell the world that God exists, just look at the universe. God exists, just look at the morals or the lack thereof. That God exists because the only other alternative is a denial of the God who made it all. To say there is a God because just look at true science. There is a God. Look at this human body. Can you believe these foolish people? Elvis is alive and God is dead. And the foolish people to say millions of years ago man developed a brain. Another three million years passed he developed a stomach. Another two million years passed, he developed a lung. And then another 10 million, he developed a heart. And then he developed teeth and then eyes. What kind of fool would believe that? I love to tell the world there is a God because of inspiration. 2 Peter 1, verse 20 and 21. I'd love to tell people if I had but one more sermon to preach... And I couldn't put it in words to convince them, but just tell them there is a God in heaven. And he made it all. Number two, I would tell people if I had but one sermon to preach. I would love to tell people about the Bible. The book that we know as the Bible. 
which is God's breathed words. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. When the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, God's breathed book confirms that it is what it claims to be, and the Bible is as old as it claims to be. From the time that Genesis 1, verse 1 was spoken to this present day, August the 3rd, 2016, there's been 5,975 years to go by. So says this book. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to debate about it. You don't have to go into some uh, psychological uh, mental state to find that out. It is in the book. When you go back to Genesis 1, verse 1, according to the Bible, it is the year 3,959 B.C., And when you read the first five chapters of Genesis, you've got 1,656 years to go by. And it brings us down to 2303 B.C. And then from chapter 6 through chapter 11, verse 26, another 427 years go by. Brings us down to 1876 B.C. And on and on we can go. In other words, from Genesis 1 through Genesis 11, there's 2,083 years to go by. And in those chapters... Forty times the Bible says, and God said, this book we know as the Bible. Those 40 authors in 66 books and 1189 chapters and 31,102 verses and 773,746 words and 3,566,480 letters and there's not a mistake in it. That book tells, I love to tell the world, take this book. The Koran is not from God. Joseph Smith's book is not from God. The New World Translation of Jehovah's Witness is not from God. The Baptist Manual is not from God. The Methodist Discipline is not from God. The Gospel Advocate is not from God. Only this book is his breathed words and it will judge us in the last day. I would have to tell people that, John 12, 48. That you're going to stand before God and the books will be open. And you're going to answer for the deeds done in your body, whether they be good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. We have found over 5,500 manuscripts. And each and every manuscript confirms the Bible that we have to be God's word. What it is and as old as it claims to be. My friend, it's proven by chronology, archaeology, history, and science, and prophecy over and over and over. For an example, I would love to tell people to find a mistake in it. It doesn't matter where you start. You can start with the beginning or the end. You're going to find that there's, uh, you know, 3,959 years in the Old Testament and 96 years in the New Testament. There's 4,055 years from Genesis 1 through Genesis uh, Revelation 22. And that's it. But what I love to do is tell people, go to 1 Kings 6 and verse 1 when the Bible says, the fourth year of King Solomon, which was a 480th year after the children of Israel came out of Egypt. What does that mean to you? It confirms the Bible to be what God said it is, His words. The fourth year of Solomon is 966. 480 years since they came out of Egypt. Add 480 to 966, you've got 1446. You start with Genesis 1, you come up to the time that they leave Egypt, you've got 1446. You start with Revelation and come back to Exodus, you still get 1446. This is an amazing book, regardless of where you start. It has no mistakes, and what God said is a final answer for it all. And I love to tell people, take the Bible, read it and obey it, and ask those four questions. I love to ask four questions to these people. And that is, where are you? That's number one. And I love to ask number two concerning when he said, where are you? He said, now, God is challenging them. Let me say this before I forget. These questions were not just asked just to, you know, take up space and take up time. He says, who told you these things? And he says, why have you disobeyed me? And then number four, he asked the question, what have you done? This book is a final answer for it all. That's why on day one, when God made day and night, 
before he made the sun, moon, and stars on the fourth day because that's what God said. I have to tell people the Bible is God's book and it's going to judge you in the last day. There's only one rule book, Philippians 3 verse 16, and that is the Bible. And that is the very standard by which we will be judged. And number three, if I had but one sermon to preach, I told you it'd be simple, nothing you haven't heard before. I would tell them about the church of Christ. I would have to tell people about God, about his book, and I'd have to tell them about the church for which my Lord died. And let me tell you why. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. That was a promise he made. We know he kept his promise because in Acts 20, verse 28, he purchased the church with his own blood. And besides that, the Bible says it became a reality in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost in A.D. 33 when Peter preached the first gospel sermon. And people who listened to Peter when he said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts 2 verse 38. They were added to that church. Acts 2 verse 47. And you cannot ask what church because there was only one at that time. That's what I would have to tell people. Ephesians 4, 4, the Bible says the body is the church. In Ephesians 1, 22, 23, there is but one body. Oh, I know you know this, but my friend, in a lot of places among us, we no longer say this. We no longer preach this. We act as if sometimes we are ashamed of this. Brethren, we've got to get back to saying something, not almost say something. We've got to get back to plain talk and not double talk. We've got to get away from throwing curves around people to spare their feelings lest we might think they'll be run off. When I talk about that church, let me tell you why I would tell about that church. In Ephesians 1, verse 3 and 4, Ephesians 3, verses 9 through 12, God said, as He speaks through Paul, He said, before the foundation of the world, I purposed, I promised to give the world the church. Don't ever think too little of the church and think it's less important than what it really is. Before God made the first goldfish, before he made the first plum tree, before he made the first baboon, before he made the first man, before he made the first watermelon, he says, I will give the world the church. In Galatians 4 verse 4, the Bible says, In the fullness of time, God brought forth that church. Everything in the Bible has one theme, the coming of Christ and the establishment of His church. Every scripture, everything from Genesis 1 up to Acts 2 is the coming of the church. Acts 3 to the end of the book of Revelation chapter 22 points back to Acts 2. The whole theme of the Bible is the coming of Christ. Read Genesis 3 verse 15 and 16. The promise that God made to the world and then he began to unfold his great and wonderful and master plan that Jesus would be born and that he would live 33 years and go to the cross and shed his blood and purchase the church. And my friend, in the days of the apostles, the book that is God's book, the one that is God breathed, the one that is inspired says it was called the church of Christ, Romans 16, 16. My question now is to you, where are you in relation to that? Who told you that you can take the church of your choice? Now I'm talking about I had but one sermon to preach. Who told you that one church was good as another? Why have you disobeyed God in not accepting that and becoming a member of that church? And what have you done if you leave this world unprepared? I would tell the world about the church. I would tell the world about this book that is the Bible that would judge us, that is God's inspired words. And I would tell them about Jehovah God who reigns, who lives in heaven. But number four, I would ask those four questions. And I love to tell people based on those four questions. When they asked Peter, what must we do to be saved? Acts 2, verse 37. I would say the answer to that, we go to the book of books, what God has said. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. How, 
How much plainer could it be, brethren and friends and neighbors? How much plainer could Jesus have made it? You must believe and be baptized to be saved. Peter said, repent and be baptized for forgiveness of sins. Peter said in 1 Peter 3, 21, that baptism doth also now save us. Salvation is in Christ, 2 Timothy 2, 10. How do you get into Christ? I would tell the world. For as many of you that have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Who told you that baptism is not necessary for salvation? Who told you that? Why have you seen what God has so plainly stated and you've disobeyed Him? Who told you that faith only would save when God says faith only will not save? James 2, 24. Who told you that grace alone would save you? Who told you that? Brethren, who told you that we could take the Lord's Supper on a day other than Sunday? Who told you that? What have we done? Brethren, why is it we no longer preach on hell like we used to? When, besides here, when's the last time you've heard a good old-fashioned gospel sermon on the horrors of hell that you could smell the stench of brimstone. I don't know about here, but in Limestone County, I don't need two hands. I don't even need one hand. I don't even need three fingers to tell you of all the congregations in that county how many practice discipline consistently. When Paul said, I command you, brethren, to withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. We run from that like a dog that's been, you know, jumped on by a bigger dog. We don't know part of it. What's happened to our teaching and preaching? When's the last time we preached that it is a sin for a man to have long hair that you can't tell the difference between him and a girl? Read Revelation 9, verse 7 and 8. And 1 Corinthians 11, verse 14. Why don't we preach that anymore? Why? Why don't we go back when the Bible says the Old Testament is our example Romans 15, verse 4. Why don't we tell these young boys and girls, you shouldn't be tattooing your bodies up. Read Leviticus 19, 26 through 28. Read Exodus 21, verse 6. You shouldn't be putting rings in your, in your nose and in your lips and in your cheeks and in your eyebrows. And we need daddies who will say, you're not going out of this house looking like that. And young lady, you go in there and put on some clothes. I think I said it last year, but I'll say it again. In some places, the church reminds us in an assembly like this of Kentucky Fried Chicken. All we see is breast, legs, and thighs. And it's a shame the way we're dressing. It really is. Here's an example. Here's a mother. She just gets out of the shower. And she has her hair in rollers. She has on a chenille bathrobe. Some of the younger people may not know what a chenille bathrobe is, but it goes from her feet all the way up to her neck, and she's got it covered up. And she's got on house shoes and a pair of socks because it's cold. And the doorbell rings. And Mama says, will somebody get the door? I'm not dressed. And here's little Susie, who's got on what she calls hot pants and a halter top that you can see through. She said, oh, I'll get it. I'm dressed. Have I missed it, Brother Ronnie? Have I missed that somewhere? And somebody say, look at that woman out there, how she's dressed in that yard working. She's overweight. She's an old woman. She's got gray hair. She's got cellulite from her neck down to her toes. I wouldn't be out here dressed like that for nothing. What's the difference in that? And a young lady that's 22 that's still, you know, got all the, the things that God had blessed her with and been so good to her. It's the clothing. And here's this man out cutting his grass. Somebody like me. Look at that man, them shorts on. Don't have any hair on his leg. He's white as a piece of cotton. And just look at them old bones and old ribs showing. If I was him, I'd put on a shirt. But it's okay for a 23-year-old that's muscular and tan. He can dress like that. What's happened to our thinking, brethren? When we talk about the church... 
We need to keep the church pure for the next generation and we need to do a lot better job than we have in the last 25 years in most places. Not only just doctrine, but in holy living, the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we act. And we need to be telling these young girls and these young boys, you stay out of backseat of cars and you stay out of motel rooms until you're married. We were the last generation that was so stupid that we thought we had to have a husband to have a baby. Brethren, we need to get back to these things. And if I had one sermon to preach, oh, I would tell the world about that church and what to do to be saved. But once we are in the church and we've been baptized for the remission of sins, we must remain faithful unto the end. Brethren, where are you? Where are you? Who told you? that you didn't have to attend every Wednesday and every Sunday night. Who told you that? Why have you disobeyed God? He so plainly stated what he wanted you to do and what he wanted me to do. And what have we done? Look at the church in some places. You know, to get noses and dollars and pay for the big castles and cathedrals we're building, brethren, we have compromised. We've compromised. I'm telling you, people like Brother Kemp and Brother Foy Wallace, people like Brother Geddes Roy, people like Brother Woodson, other than somebody like Runny who stands firm in the old past, they wouldn't recognize the church today in a lot of places because we're just become the newest denomination in town. That's what I would tell my brethren. I would remind my brethren of what Paul told the elders in Ephesians 20, I'm sorry, what he told the elders at Ephesus in Acts 20, verse 17, beginning. When he says, understand how serious it is to be an elder. Number two, know the Bible. Number three, make sure the Bible is preached. Number four, know who false teachers are. And number five, he said this. He said, know how precious the church is. Brethren, we should end the service without giving the gospel plan of salvation. Who told us that we didn't have to do these things? May I suggest unto you number five, and if you'll be patient, you have been patient with me. Maybe I should have stuck with my thumb drive and the PowerPoint, but I hope this will at least challenge us. The fifth thing I'd like to just mention, based on those four questions that God asked, is this. Remember those four now. One day, Hebrews 9, verse 27, it's appointed unto man wants to die and then cometh the judgment. We all are going to pass from this life to the next. If we're alive when Jesus comes, 1 Thessalonians 4, the Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that we'll be changed into that more immortal, glorified body. But when our Lord comes back with a shout, the voice, and the trump, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive will be changed. The great judgment will be set, Matthew 25, verse 31 through 46. My friend and neighbor, I would, if I had one sermon to preach, I would definitely say that we all are going to pass from this life to the next. And once you do, there are no changes on the other side when we cross those chilly waters. I'm encouraging you, is what I would tell them, to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. That's not Church of Christ doctrine. That's not Butterworth and Hayes doctrine. God said for one to please him and enter his church, which is his bride, and the one he's coming back to save, Ephesians 5, 23, you must be in that one church. And once we're in that one church, we're to live faithful unto death, Revelation 2, 10, that we would receive the crown. When that great judgment is set, and everyone who's ever lived, Jesus will put them either on the right or the left. Those on the right, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant, Matthew 25, 21. And those on the left, he will say, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, verse 41 through 46. I guess I've got two or three minutes left. I don't know. I can't see that clock. I've got what the old uh, ophthalmologist told me. He said, Ken, you got presbyopia. And at first I thought, oh, me. I'm going to lose everything. And he laughed. He said, you got old eyes. And so that's what I have. 
my great grandson who is be eight in two weeks. I was over keeping him yesterday and staying with him and I was kidding with him. He has a touch of autism, but he's precious. And he, I said, well, you ought to be nice to old granddaddy. I said, because I'm the young kid and you're the old man. I said, you ought to go on and fix me something to eat and put a good show on, on Netflix and let me watch it. And you ought to let me lay on the couch. He said, granddaddy, he said, you're an old man. He said, just go in there in the bathroom and look in the mirror and look at your old ugly face. He said, just go in there and look. I, I know that. I can't change it. Okay. Let me say this. I'm going to close with a, one last point. If I had one more sermon to preach, you say, <laughs> that wouldn't, you know, you, you need to get you another one. I would tell people about God. I would tell them about this book. I would tell them about the church and what to do to be saved. And I would tell them that there's a judgment coming. I can't make them. I wouldn't spend three days trying to convince them. But since Ronnie said that I had one more sermon to preach, I would tell them about heaven, which is God's home, that Jesus has prepared, John 14, 1 through 6. That's where I want you to go. That's where I hope you want to go. And that's where I hope we all will be around God's throne forever and ever. Being baptized into Christ, become a member of the Lord's church, the church of Christ, and being faithful unto death. That's what it's going to take. But there's a place that's called hell. I believe if I had another three minutes or four, if I had one more sermon to preach, I would tell them and remind them of that old poem. And I want you to listen carefully. Somebody says, Ken, when you preach hell or Ronnie, you preach hell and yet you can smell the stench of brimstone. Don't you know that's going to scare young people? I hope we do scare them. I hope we will scare them and leave an impact and a mark on their lives to say, I don't want to go there. Quickly now, we'll close and I'll offer the invitation. It says, a Texas cowboy fell to the barroom floor, having drunk so much he could drink no more, and he went to sleep with a troubled brain, and he dreamed he rode the hell-bound train. With murderous blood, the engine was damp and was brilliantly lit with a brimstone lamp. A servant for fuel was shoveling bones, and the engine rang out with a thousand groans. The boiler was filled with dark draft beer, and the devil himself was the engineer. The passengers were a mixed-up crew, church members, atheists, Gentile and Jew, rich men in broadcloth, beggars in rags, beautiful young ladies, and withered old hags. Black men, yellow, brown, and white, all chained together and smelling like brimstone. Oh, my, what a stinking sight. The train rushed on at an awful pace, and the sufferers' flames scorched their hands in their face. And faster and faster the engine flew, and wider and wider the country grew, and brighter and brighter the lightning flashed, and louder and louder the thunder crashed, and hotter and hotter the flames became, till it scorched their souls in the red-hot flames. Then out of the distance there arose a yell, Ha ha, so the devil were near in hell. And oh how the passengers screamed with pain, they begged the devil to stop the train. Well he only capered about and danced for glee, and he made fun of their misery. Well my good friends, you've done the work. I the devil a payday will not shirk. You paid full fast, so I'll see you through. The devil always pays what's due. Why again, the labor's always worth of his hire, and I'm going to land you safely in the eternal fire. You've bullied the weak and you've robbed the poor. You turned the starving brother from the door. You've drunk, you rioted, you cheated, you lied. You missed services, you denied God, and you denounced the Bible, and you rejected his church in your hell-bound pride. Again, you paid full fare, so I'll see you through. I, the devil, always pay what's due. The cowboy awoke with an awful cry. When the devil said, I'm going to take your souls and put them in the flames that soar, and there you'll be forevermore. But you see, the cowboy, when he awoke with that awful cry, his obedience was not in vain, for he never rode that hell-bound train. Brethren, I have a little common sense to know there's not a train going to hell, but it's a picture for us to look at that Satan's getting all he can to go there. Don't let him have his way with thee. Reject him. Love the God of heaven. Love the Bible, his word. Love the church of Christ for which Jesus purchased with all of his blood. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Be faithful unto death and receive the crown in the end and avoid that awful place that's called hell. I would have to say those five things if I had one sermon to preach. Being here tonight, I'm in hopes that if you're not a member of the Church of Christ, you realize that you are welcome, 
you are really in many ways a blessing and we appreciate you being here and studying with us. Please, if you have questions, ask. We promise to give you a Bible answer and not try to run or ram anything down your throat and put pressure on you to do this or that, but we'll teach you God's Word and the decision is yours. We'll encourage you to obey, yes. Please think about this. If it came across any other way, I apologize. I came here intended to do good and to cause us to think about those four questions that God asked Adam and Eve. And the last one, what have you done? How many times will that be said on the day of judgment? If you're subject to the invitation as we sing the song, please come and tell us your need.